Okay, um, lovely to see everybody here uh, and um, uh, looking forward to a, 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 a fantastic hour's conversation with Avin. Uh, congratulations on, uh, on your award. And I think we're going to start, we're going to start, I have, a, I've, I've done my homework, <laughs> but we're going to start by talking about, the, <laughs> we're going to start by talking about the play itself, The Half yeah. Widow, and a very simple question to start off with, yeah. what was your initial point of inspiration for it? Uh, it was seeing in the newspaper, which was uh, The Guardian, I think, the uh, news that uh, India had uh, effectively um, shut down all the internet and uh, uh, imposed a curfew on the Kashmir Valley, which wasn't the first time they'd done this, but they uh, effectively annexed Kashmir by removing its autonomy, um, scrapping a particular article which gave it uh, its own um, uh, special status, if you like. And I was struck by the fact that this hadn't really been reported beyond that first couple of days and I, I mean one of the good reasons for that would have been because there were no uh, there were no real news reports coming out of there because there was no internet so it was really Indian journalists who were in there who were then coming out back to Delhi because they could travel freely and then releasing that news through um, you know Delhi newspapers and media outlets and our uh, this is a struggle that's been going on for 30 odd years and I realized that we're barely reported here and so it's I started to you know think hmm there's a story here that needs to be told I think. Right right it's very interesting I mean it's uh, when you prepare for one of these um, um, chats you kind of look at how the, the, the person presents himself and obviously obviously I spent a lot of time on your website <laughs> And I was very struck by there's a you, you include a lot of his, of detail about the Kashmir historical detail because I, it seems to me that you want us to um, uh, become particularly aware of that history, mm -hmm. um, how that plays into our understanding of the play something slightly different because I always think the challenge with it's interesting you you, you took initiation from a, new, a kind of news story rather than an individual. Because the challenge always in these kind of dramas is to find a personal story mm -hmm. that best kind of allows you to explore the political situation. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you went around integrating the story that you just told us, which is a new story, with the story of um, Zamira, your central character. Well, yes. Um, well, the thing is, this is actually largely the way I've worked up until now anyway, um, which is looking at a period of history or a particular particular geographical region or political situation and researching that to the point where I then can declare myself an expert <laughs> because it was part of my initial imposter syndrome when I start, first started writing, which was uh, how I need to write about something that I know about, but then it was more about, well, that all started off with thinking, well, I need to, I need to know what is, uh, what, what is, what are the important themes? Uh, what is the struggle of the people, most people in the situation? How does that compare to what we know? And what we did with the, with the half widow is I just think, okay, here we have a society where the, the average person, the Kashmiri uh, Muslim in the in the valley, has two opposing forces. One is the Indian occupiers, but they also suggest uh, change and uh, a brighter future, if you like, if you were to go along with that particular uh, ethos. But they also represent what has been oppressing these people for so long. And on the other side, you have the militancy, which is really um, what has been the only voice of Kashmiri independence for all this time and, and yet siding with that there's too much blood that has been shed for that not to for you to turn your back on that so that I started to realize okay well here are two opposing forces and this is what the average person is stuck between so then that gives you your protagonist um, and the protagonist for me came fairly quickly because I started to read about the half widows who, you know, who are people whose um, whose uh, uh, husbands have been disappeared during the course of uh, the thirty-year occupation, and with no recourse to, you know, law because 
the the public safety act just allowed people to be arrested without impunity and that made me realize that okay here are some people who are stuck in this system and what we need to do is start creating a protagonist where you have characters and if you like the forces of antagonism come from both sides and they then uh, are personified in characters so it's suddenly you have three characters it is interesting you talked about the average person and now zamira may be zamira may be many things but she's not in many, certain respects, she's not your average person. Yes. You know, I've got down here three words. I've got um, hustler, matriarch, survivor. Mm. I'm sure there are others. In fact, the the, 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 the the character that she kind of initially reminded me a little bit of was Mother Courage. Okay. I yeah, don't yeah, know whether that yeah. was... And it's so, you know, she may be the pearl that's caused by the forces that are uh, uh, um, forced upon her from both sides. But her response is anything but average. Can you tell us a little bit more about how she came to be shaped and, and also how she came to be shaped over the process of writing the play? Because I imagine that, like many of us, you started out with, with a sense of who this character was, but in terms of the drafts and the way you worked on it, certain other aspects began to be burnished up, as it were. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, so she, she initially came about because I read uh, lots of different... Uh, short news reports from the Kashmiri crisis about, um, for example, one travel agent who, uh, reaper after her business, obviously went, um, uh, you know, went south after the uh, internet crackdown in, in the same way as many people experience lockdown here. Mm -hmm. She repurposed her, um, uh, uh, her agency, which had landlines, got them working very quickly and then allowed people to start using those landlines uh, to reconnect with family because, you know, what had happened was people couldn't even talk to their own family who are maybe a few streets away, let alone in another town, or even have any sense of whether they were still alive or had not been, whether they'd been arrested or, you know, whether anything about the outside world. And so I thought, okay, here's, here's a character, here's something slightly heroic, but what I thought, my characters and you know, I, I never want them to be too heroic. I want them to be a bit more real. So I think, well, she needs to make a bit of cash as well. <laughs> so let's let let's take take that character and actually make them a bit more um, uh, what's the word? A bit more cynical, if you like, so that it gives them a sort of roundness. They're not um, uh, they're not the sort of uh, uh, hero um, superhero kind of figure. And that's kind of how I start. I don't think she was originally the travel agent. I had another character as a travel agent, and then slowly went. Oh, it makes more sense for her to be that. And during the process of writing it, her sort of her her you know other uh, attributes came as a result of trying to structure the drama in a way that fitted. Uh, uh, so did she start out as more cynical and, and and more what's the right word manipulative, and then gradually that became. I mean, I, the, what tends to happen is that things become more nuanced, don't they? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, she is splendidly kind of pragmatic uh, in, in many respects, but it's a pragmatism entirely born out of her her situation, mm. and it's it, it, you know, as as uh, because of that, you cannot not but sympathise with her and empathise with her, and ask yourself the question: So, what would I have done in that situation? And I think that's that that seems to me the sign of a really great character. Yeah. I also visualise her as well. I've got this kind of image of her, you know, and I think that, that that's that's tremendous for, ra for radio, is that when you listen to a character talk and suddenly you think you can imagine what they might look like, yeah. you know, and I think that's also very, a, 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 a real, um, it's a real, a, a real way in which you can add to, to characterization on radio. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so what's my question? My, que <laughs> my question is, was there, was there any particular woman or, 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 or female presence in your life that kind of informed this character? Because it felt no. so real. It really felt very, very um, lived. Not consciously, but obviously she's an amalgamation of so many people, not necessarily that I just know, but also um, movies and I've seen and books I've read. And I think what struck me was even when you're hustling and you're trying your best to survive and you might do bad things, it's really fundamentally about the character, you know, as a lot of every writer knows, is about the choice that you make under pressure and when the stakes are higher than what we normally would um, experience. And in her case, it was when she has to make that choice, the, the, the choice that, that would 
make her choose between the lesser of two, she has to choose between you know the lesser of two evils uh, she goes with her nature and and trusts herself to be able to fight through it and i think that yeah. we love a that, character like that, don't we we love so a character that no matter what situation they find themselves they're, they're kind of thinking slightly ahead uh, and thinking of a way of, of of either improving the situation or getting out of a situation yeah something, something about that kind of that kind of cunning quality that is very there's something very attractive about that i think very life enhancing yeah um, she also says in part two this is really interesting she says she's wasted she said at one point i wasted half my life waiting for a ghost mm. which is this wonderful line that you have wonderful line and um, i have a theory that basically all drama is ghost stories okay yeah. all drama is about arthur miller famously said that all drama is about the chickens coming home to roost uh -huh. So it's all yeah. about the past and the way the past plays out in the present. Yes. So I kind of wanted to know, how does that operate with Zamira? Oh, what's, yeah. What's the, what's the past in her life that she's playing out in order to resolve it, to move on? Because obviously, as a half-widow, mm. she has this thing hanging over her. I just wanted yes. to talk a bit about that, because I think that's really interesting. Well, I think that the past that uh, what I was trying to do I suppose was tell a story that tried to encompass what the last 30 years of Kashmir was about without um, without writing a saga you know, this is all takes place over the course of a few days um, soon after the lockdown and what I decided what I realized that the lockdown was something that had happened many times before the only difference this time was the um, annexing of the state and these internet blackouts were frequent the curfews are frequent but they go back 30 years so what that had effectively done is that had set the clock back 30 years and what we are having there we we, we are forcing a situation where uh, her son now has to look to the militancy uh because he, he feels that that's um you know that's honor is honoring the legacy of his uh, disappeared father mm. and what she's been trying to do for 20 years is get away from that and uh, if you like the, the the character that's her lover in it or long term um, uh, best friend represents the future and where uh, India could take them if we could just um, set aside these uh, you know the, the the blood that has uh, flown since then and I think um, by the resurfacing of the uh, uh, the militancy if you like in a new form as a result of the Indian government forcing it you then dredge up all the old um, uh, feuds and the old, uh, uh, you know, the sleeping dogs, like the chickens that come home to roost. And that is where, you know, that ups, that's, if you like, the inciting incident that upsets the fragile balance of the past, uh, which just leaks out. Um, it's interesting. It's her son, in a sense, who's more trapped by the past than she is. Well, she is, but she's the one that kind of uh, eventually, as I said, comes to this point of self-awareness i've wasted half my life waiting for wasted half my life waiting for a ghost yes and, yes i mean she is the pragmatist you know yeah. it, it wasn't for the fact that she had a son to try and get through university and there was an opportunity there to send him to a better life uh which he fights against um is uh without without the yeah you know that that's her problem she wants to move on despite the guilt yeah. But, um, uh, but even her opportunities to move on are compromised, aren't, aren't you? Because she, she she becomes the other woman, doesn't she? She becomes the mistress rather than, you know, you know the uh, the, the, the the wife. So yes. it's a really it's it's a, it's it's a decision that, in its complexity, mm -hmm. it feels really real. Okay, no, great. Yeah, I, <laughs> I did spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking. No, that's nonsense. You need to throw that out. You know, that, that doesn't, people don't behave like that. And uh, so it was a lot of time spent, you know, what would she actually do? But I think that also she, part of my process isn't, isn't even um, thinking about these things. Part of it is actually approaching it as an actor. Yes. So uh, quite often I'll put people in a room and they'll just have a conversation. Yes. Well, I mean, not a conversation, but they're trying to get something from each other. And then you find out a little bit more about them. Most of this ends up on the cutting room floor, but yes. it gives you a little nugget. They go, ah, oh, yeah. Uh, you almost find yourself improvising with the characters in the room. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the acting and how that's influenced your writing in a bit, because I agree with you. I think that 
that you know there's so many great um dramatists who are actors yeah on that point actually um slightly on that point of having the conversation jonathan ruffle who's here he um he uh, uh he, he introduced <laughs> me to the idea of putting the um uh, characters on the couch uh so you know there'll be a whole yeah. periods where i'll just chat to them and they'll i'll write what they say back to me um and that gives you i don't know it starts giving you the whole that whole um three-dimensionality the history of the character and, and then after a while that draft starts to write itself because yes, you've got yes, so much right. of who they are uh, it's options they are. they're kind of creating options uh, uh, the, the character starts to respond and it creates a series of options that you can pursue mm. um, and that's very exciting so let's just step back from this, this particular play mm. um Again, looking at your website, um, your previous uh, writing, Subterranean, is it Sepoys? Yes, yeah. Sepoys and Tommies, both set around military conflicts or mm -hmm. the wars. And I just wondered, is this a subject that particularly draws you? Um, you know, in a, in a war, the, 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 any implicit con conflict is made explicit, isn't it, in the sense? Mm. And of course, drama thrives on conflict but I just wondered I mean even in your um the, the, the program about the um sorry the one about the plane and people coming from um, um oh this is your country too yeah. your country yeah that's that's set at a time of heightened um tension but I just wondered if it's if war particularly fascinates you yes uh it does uh I think the first world war in particular fasc had fascinated me and read a lot about it in my um, uh, many years before I actually wrote Subterranean Sepoys, but what happened practically was that um, money was flying around. I thought this is a chance to become a writer. Let's see if I can get my hands on some of it. Um, because the other option is to a write. brilliantly pragmatic approach, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But, uh, sorry, let me answer the question. No, no, no that, that's, that's great. <laughs> but, but, it's, but I knew a lot about the First World War already. Uh, right. But when I approached people and talked about them, there is this, there was always this slight, um, thing on their face that you'd say, well, why are you talking about the First World War? Shouldn't you be talking about partition or something like yes. that? You know what I mean? So, so I, I, I deliberately looked at the Indian Army um, experience in the First World War, not because I was initially interested in that, but then once obviously I started looking at it, this is amazing, this is like fascinating stuff. But I think that what happened in say the Western Front, which is our sort of, um, you know, enduring image of what we are taught at school or the limited narrative that we are given is, is I imagine what was it like if I was born a hundred years ago in, I don't know, uh, Luton, um, uh, I would have been falling over myself to sign up to that and experience that for however long I would. And I think we've lost any real connection with that side, part, part, that bit of the past. Uh, and, and what it was to be human and a human outlook, our emotional outlook, our, our, our um, uh, what does that world look like? Um, it's fascinating it you say like? that because I don't know whether you've seen, this is a bit of a digression, but I mentioned mm. it. Have you seen Peter Jackson's um, documentary where he, he takes all of the black and white footage of, of all the young, you know, squaddies going up to the first yeah. floor, and then about half an hour in, it, it turns into color. I have to admit, I burst into tears at that point because suddenly mm. things were retrieved from history and all of those terribly, all those young boys, boys and mm. their teenagers with their classic British bad teeth, you know, smiling up with their roll up cigarettes, but in colour, mm. incredibly moving. If you've not seen it, that kind of, it kind of really brought back history into the kind of modern world. Yes, yes. And I think that what, what, but the thing is, we, we then have a choice, I think, is it, do, are we going to tell those stories poetically, which is kind of what Subterranean Sepoys was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the heart of it is a, a story of betrayal and making a choice between colonial, your colonial masters and uh, your own family that are in a, uh, sitting in the trench with you, uh, which is like an age old story of a, a war, but there, but also, but then when we went on to Tom, when I went on to work on Tommy's, what Jonathan and the team there introduced me to was the idea of the mundanity of war yeah. and the everyday pr procedural side of it. And people that you recognize doing at work, doing what, you know, you do day in, day out and having the, the same, that kind of granularity was what really um, set Tommy's apart. 
was we were looking at really what is it a signaler does from day to day you know what what, what is uh, what are their problems what are the issues they have with their superiors and and this it's it's very brave thing that that series did because it's so easy to go for uh because there's so much um so much you can do that's going to tug at the heartstrings or play to the stereotypes of that war which are which are, you know even i still meet people well you, you still meet people who think there was a football match you know in, in no man's land and there never was but everybody you know assumes that happened you know and uh, i think that working with tommy's and jonathan people like that they said no look at the record and then work to the record and then you'll find just oceans of really exciting stuff that has completely been missing from education or our popular media or uh, you know any kind of stories about the war and and, um, and I think that's what interested me about the first war telling some stories different to the ones that we hear day in day out the unknown stories I love Which the word 99 percent of it yeah I love, the, I love that word granularity I think that's brilliant I think mm. you know again as dramatists it's this whole notion of it's it's a specific detail that leads to the universal doesn't it it's that kind of um, you know, once you worked out what shoes a character wears, somehow you open the door to a, a, an entire world. Yes, and a lot of what we talk about with the First World War is a myth. Um, you know, that what we know now, 100 years later, people have made a decision about what that is and how they should feel about it. And I think that what Tommy's did is, no, 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 we need to actually look at what happened, yeah. what actually yeah. happened, and digging out war diaries of the, the most fantastic characters that have just not survived you know um, did you ever get a chance to go to the imperial war museum yes yeah well I, yes uh, i mean oh. sort of it was my second home for, <laughs> for a long it's period it's amazing of time. the archive in that is just amazing i did some research a long time ago and mm. it was just my, it was just opened up my mind to exactly what you're saying a whole set of different stories just amazing just amazing let's talk about the fact that you were an actor and you wrote your first script at the at the grand young age of 40. Now, I love your commentary on, on your website. You say, as an actor, you were playing villains, IT geeks, shop shopkeepers, accountants, and, of course, drug dealers. <laughs> Is that the reason you decided that you wanted to write? Were you just, were you just tired of, the, uh, of the, the poor range of characters that you were offered? Or, you know, was that, was that part of your motivation? Well, partly, yeah, I mean, partly it was cash, um, you know, you're just not getting enough work. And uh, unfortunately, the problem with acting is it's demand and supply. And similar to writing, you know, there are lots of actors who can do it and not enough work flying around. And, and you know, it, that you've learned in basic economics is that in your economics classes that as soon as supply increases, more actors are going to join, uh, are going to appear because they go, oh, there's work. So, um and I think what it is, is ultimately the problem with acting is you're totally limited by the, um, your appearance and the colour of your skin. So uh, I was being sort of asked to play um, uh, uh, characters that um, other people probably were more suited to. You know, I can't remember the last time I was on television using my own accent. Yes. Um, and I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's just that you get you you are asked to use about that much of your ability and experience and talent um once a year and really i just felt like wasting my life yes. <laughs> frankly yes. um but i still love acting and i enjoy it incredibly but um it, it's just not challenging enough um so it draws on a very as you say you've got a range and it just draws on a very narrow part of that yeah and of course i always think the one of the, the terrible thing well at least when I write a script, if nobody performs it, at least I have that thing which I've written. Yeah. As an actor, I would imagine you, will, you're, you, you have to, other people are deciding whether you exist or not. You walk into a room with an audition and they're making a decision about. Yes, and you can't based reuse on quite, it. As you say, based on a very superficial reading. Yeah, yeah, and you can't reuse that. It's wasted work, you know, apart from maybe you've got to do, uh, you know, polish up your American accent or something like that, which is, you know, that might be useful, but with writing you can reuse that ip you know you it's a still it's, the product is being formed as you write each draft for example um even if it doesn't get commissioned or it's a spec script or whatever um, but i think with um with, with what really happened was that as an actor i realized that um as i started writing that really i wasn't really an actor in my dna maybe t television and film yes but you know i'm not naturally a theater kind of person even though i've cut my teeth in that 
and really I was a, a right you know I liken it to you know uh, uh, do you know Grace Stoke the legend of Tarzan yeah. where he um, uh, he's brought up by um, for 20 years he thinks he's a chimpanzee so you know for 20 years I thought I, I was an act not saying that actors are chimpanzees <laughs> but um, and then uh, one day you know I started writing and ha started hanging out with writers I went hang on this is actually who I am I need to learn to you know um, use a knife and fork and, and oh this has all come really naturally and I suddenly realized that's actually what I was and what acting had done is it I'd spent 20 odd years reading loads of fantastic scripts getting to perform in some of them and by osmosis that the whole idea of what is great dialogue had just got into me and all I had yeah. to do was go away and learn about structure and you know get some experience well you, you as you quite rightly point out you've been absorbing those things anyway I mean I always see it, the great thing about it coming from an acting background is that you again we come back to the word pragmatic it's about what works on stage isn't it it's you know the lights go down the curtain goes up and it, there's a question of what is what is can be performed and what can work and that yeah. just bring that incredible that incredible sort of pragmatic practical magic Oh, totally. And, and when you, well, I write my scripts completely with actors in mind, not, not specific actors, but I mean, uh, to be performed, uh, because I can imagine picking the thing up, an actor picking it up and saying it uh, or asking me questions about it. Um, so when we went into studio and Tommy's, it was great to be able to go, I know that I don't have to get this bit of dialogue right because the actor will sort it out for me, <laughs> you know, because I know, because I'm one of them as well. But also, but also, I, yes, you have a, facility for dialogue as well I always think in creative writing classes it's the most difficult thing to try and teach is dialogue I think mm. either people have it or they don't you also describe yourself as an immersive script writer now this is mm. really interesting what uh, what is how what, how do you define an immersive script writer uh, how does it contribute to your writing well immersive is probably is, is generally described as anything that uses um mixed reality technologies um or the, so for example immersive audio uh in um, virtual reality augmented reality uh, etc um or extended reality is really what xr is i suppose uh, but um it, i'm more interested in that which is interactive so uh, those that where you where we're now seeing a divided line between um, uh, playable stories and video games. Um, you know, I never really I missed the whole PlayStation generation, but, uh, you know, played uh, video games on my old spectrum when I was a kid. And, and now that there's virtual reality, I'm actually now seeing the real potential of that, because what I love about virtual reality and augmented reality in particular VR, is that in um, the problem with my plays is they tend to be about uh, historical subjects or colonial legacy or diverse um, uh, brown people or, you know, or whatever, people that you don't normally see in popular culture and history. And the problem with linear storytelling, which is, um, uh, say, radio, theatre and uh, film, TV, is that there is a, the emotional barrier of the fourth wall. So these characters, if they are not your culture or your background, i.e. if you're from a mainstream audience, you can feel kind of cut off from them. And it, they, they are a bit remote. It becomes a sort of intellectual exercise. Uh, and people, I spend you know a year trying to get a play off the ground and write it and blah blah, blah and it will get on and then like eight people will see it and uh, there's this all this fantastic ip that needs to be reused that's end up on the cutting room floor and i um thought ah oh, well that's because people aren't really fully engaging with it but with say vr for example and this is sort of old hat but i'll say it anyway yeah. is that you are crossing that fourth wall. You're putting yourself in the shoes of that, of the player, of the audience, of that character. You are the protagonist. And then you then start to interact with that story world with your physical self. And it's, it's quite similar to the way, say, an actor uh, prepares, if you like. But as a result, you've broken down that fourth wall. You are starting to empathize and feel what that character feels. You know, you're using your eyes, you're using your body. Uh, you are engaging with it. And um, now video games never really worked for me before because that two, two thumbs and a 2D screen isn't really uh, a physical connection with what you're seeing. But as soon as you're into VR, we are looking at um, actually physically moving in an environment as you would as a human being. And video gamers have sort of started codifying this language for a number of years. 
uh, and immersive storytellers have done that. But the problem is we're totally missing actual experienced dramatic writers from the 2D linear world, because when you see a lot of that content in VR, it's still written uh, by video gamers um, who, you know, with all due respect, don't really have any experience of character driven storytelling. And now we're going into narrative driven storytelling. It's time to start bringing people like us into that, I think. That's really, really interesting. I, you, you put on your website, again, I'm quoting you from your website, you're talking about how VCR adds diversity to narrative games, using actors to help us develop complex characters whilst exploring themes of race and identity. Mm. And obviously, we li we're living through a period uh, of, 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 of time where there is a real big conversation going on about uh, representation, who gets to tell what stories, um, how that might look, how do we, how do we create um, uh, uh, a sense of empathy which allows people to understand how somebody else might feel from a different uh, time and culture and religion and race and all of those things. And it seems to me that once again, when you talk about virtual reality, again you're talking about creating a series of options. That seems to me that in the interaction between yourself and the audience, suddenly options um, become possible for other mm -hmm. kinds of stories to be told. Um, yeah. uh, how do you? See, I mean, you've invested, it, it, and also it's a combination for you of, of writing skills and acting skills as well, isn't it? It brings two two elements of your of, yes. of, your, of your background together. Would that, would that be fair? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, the problem with um, at the moment is because it's kind of a newish area where people are even the sort of people who are the head of are, are kind of pioneers uh, it's, it's all a bit wild west <laughs> the way that uh, most of the storytelling is going. but in vr in particular is um how the question that i'm trying to answer uh, using my skills is how do you script a branching narrative other than using you know flow charts and um uh, twine scripting and what have you it's, it's a very intellectual process at the moment and for me I liken the process to uh, the way we workshop R&D in the theatre which many writers here will be really familiar with um, so as an actor I did it as a writer I did it because I don't sit down and write a play and think about it that that's not that's kind of what I did with Half Widow but before that I, there's no way I could get into a real story you know with subterranean sepoys with my stage play and, and with other work um I've got some actors in a room and improv got them to improvise and they come up with the surprising stuff that you'd never think of the stuff that is irrational and uh, real and human and with VR what we're doing is if you're going to with VR it's so expensive that what you have to do first is you have to prototype you have to design the user experience as they say or the UX and in that, what you're deciding is what is the journey the player is going to take and what, how do you mitigate for player comfort, um, immersion, their choices, how they're going to feel in VR, what, how, what they can do. And because ultimately you've got to decide all this before you're going to build the game itself because it's so expensive and you can't go backwards. And, and it's an iterative process. The problem with, with an iterative process for me is the similar, is similar to how a uh, uh, how you conduct a theatre workshop when you're workshopping your play before you write the script, mm -hmm. because you can't make these decisions uh, all in advance, and you can't make these des decisions intellectually and still have a mature piece of storytelling. You know, and diversity for me is about um, finding humour in something that everybody else finds terribly serious. Yes. In order to make it accessible for a mainstream audience, and in order to do that, you need to get people who understand. Um, how to improvise iteratively and truthfully, and that's actors. And humour can also open up possibilities of a conversation rather than close it down, which again is 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 something that we want to encourage. Yes. Have you, have you ever been involved in a, an immersive piece of theatre like Punch Drunk or, or anything like that? I was. Yeah, we used to do a lot of that when uh, uh, we were sort of uh, in the late nineties. There's a, there's a bunch of people. I think one of them. Um, uh, he won uh, Adam Megiddo, who won uh, the Olivier Award um, a few years ago for Showstopper, the mus uh, improvised musical. And he was um, he was doing these, he was setting these up with a couple of other old friends of mine for fun. Uh, and we just go and do like a, a weekend's uh, immersive theatre uh, game, we used to call them out in uh, the sticks somewhere where people would receive uh, some letters for like, like a murder mystery weekend, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, but now we're started doing that in virtual reality. So it's kind of quite interesting the, the, 
taking that from real life into VR. And uh, <laughs> there, there are some similarities and some differences. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to invite people to pop some questions in the chat. And Jonathan's already put in a question, which was actually going to be my next question. <laughs> because it seems to me that <laughs> you read my mind. It seems to me that you've got these different strands in your career and you've won the award and everything. What's next for you? What, what, where are you going to put, put your energies next in terms well, of storytelling? Well, um, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I'm definitely, so I'm trying to raise money for the next round of funding for my virtual reality piece, but you know, that's X amount of money that uh, for the next stage. So that's one thing, um, it's a VR um, game based on this is your country too. So uh, I don't know, how, does, how do I say this as briefly as I can? Um, it is, um, I wrote a radio play a few years ago uh, for Radio 4, which was loosely based on my family history uh, of the East African Kenyan Asians who were rendered stateless when they tried to come over to Britain uh, with their British passports. And the game, uh, they ultimately ended up being sent back to Kenya. But when they got to Kenya, they said, oh, you're, no, you've got um, a British, uh, British passport. You're not allowed back in. Off you go somewhere else. And they're like, well, I was only here 24 hours ago. You know, I spent all my life here. So, so they'd send them off to Germany or Uganda or somewhere like that. And they'd end up in this endless loop of um, state side, uh, uh, statelessness uh, on air side in all these airports. And uh, I wrote a play about that, which is kind of a sort of comedy really. And it's a bit like, um, so I took that idea, which is kind of like Tom Hanks stuck in the terminal, uh, if you've ever yes. seen that Steven yeah, Spielberg's yeah. film. Which is based on a real, real, real person, isn't it? That, uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. so they're, they're both based on real stories. and. I thought, okay, uh, what I want to do is create a virtual reality game or interactive story, uh, which we sort of started the first, uh, we just completed, say, the first stage of that, where you arrive at Heathrow Airport as the player, you hand over your British passport, but you're rejected. Um, and the thing about virtual reality is that you don't know, it's, it's a game being a narrative driven game, you don't know who you are at the beginning of the game, you, that, that, that is the central concept of um, a narrative driven game, finding out who you are. So in order to get yourself past the gatekeepers and be allowed into Britain, you have to find, you have to uncover your own cultural identity, um, identity through fragments of your, um, little fragments of your identity, which you find through your photo album. And in, in VR, that can all come to life. You can find yourself going back in time, forward in time, you know, popping through portals to meet uh, uh people in history or your friend and i think what that has given me is that opportunity to take a radio story and 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 put it in another medium uh which enables people to cross that fourth wall and and start empathizing with these characters and understanding what it is to go through immigration when you don't have white skin that's ultimately yes. the purpose of the of the story yes uh, the, i put down here an existential detective story Yes, sort of, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I'm going to steal that instantly. Uh, and of but, course, uh, and of course, exactly what you're saying is right, being made, you know, it is being is being lived out at the moment in what's happening in Eastern Europe in the Ukraine. Um, everything, as you were talking about the problems that people are having, um, I, I was aware of the news stories that are coming out of that of the Ukraine, where um, you know um, African and Indian students are finding it that much more difficult. Um, yes. So, yeah. so it, what's interesting is that in terms of your story, you've, you picked examples, Ugandan nation, um, Kashmir, of, of historical events that have some kind of historical status. But obviously, this is something that just repeats itself, doesn't it? At various mm. uh, kind of uh, no, crisis points around the globe. Um, uh, just one moment. There's another question coming up. Uh, Daryl wants to know if you write every day and if, no. if does your output vary? Are you Not somebody who sits yeah. down? No. No, I can't be asked. Listen, um, it, uh, uh, I, I'm not, I, as again, I, I may be a writer, but I just got too much going on in my head to, to, to <laughs> the stuff I want to do. Um, I'm the, you know, academically, I was a chemical engineer. So I, um, you know, I'm, my, my, I'm a bit of a scientist in my in my background and so i love messing around with software so it was partly why i was interested in vr and x i was learning to build some of those things myself not not things that you could actually sell or get anyone uh to to, to engage with in that way but really so that you can start i can start communicating with other developers and uh and to collaborate because the problem with writing every day 
I found was it's too not that it's a lonely process that it, it encouraged me too much to think of writing um, as part of a linear production pipeline, which is kind of what 2D traditional drama is. You, the writer writes it, you hand it over to the producer, then it's goodbye, then they hand it over to the director and all the actors come on board. What I like is, what I enjoy is being in iterative collaborative processes. And that's what immersive gives me. Um, so being a team player, being part of a team, a creative team is something that really fires you up. That's something that you... Yes, I can write every day. And, you know, as soon as you give me a deadline, I will I will put the output in. And there's a there's a WGGB member, uh, Anthony Johnston, who wrote a book um, called The Organised Writer, which I found so useful when I was writing Half Widow because I was getting, you know, acting things coming in. And it would taught you, it taught, it taught me how to say no, but it also taught me how to just relax about not writing. So, so it seems like you might be you'd be the sort of person who would love to be in a writer's room. Oh yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sort of in, in a self-made writer's room at the moment um, with, with, with uh, um, some uh, people who um, uh, do uh, sitcom writing, but they're not. These aren't things that I've applied to and been accepted on because the problem with writing is that as a profession, there's too much of that. It's too much of you send something in and then you, you know, you other people's mercy. And sometimes you just, it's just too soul destroying. <laughs> so it is. Yeah. I have a couple, I have a couple more questions that have come out of this conversation. Um, I wrote down technology driving art. And of course, mm. it's undoubtedly true that the way that we can tell a story has undoubtedly changed the kind of stories that we can tell. And you're kind of at the cutting edge of, edge of this. So if I was to ask you to look into your, your kind of um, a magic glass ball and think about where we might be in 10 years time in terms of telling narrative, would you like to give any kind of prophecies or? Yeah, well, I think, think I, I, I imagine that we'll be in, uh, uh, we'll be consuming a lot more extended reality stuff once the um, AR and VR kit is all um, affordable in one set of glasses, for example, which uh, so that you can see the real world as well as um, uh, the, the mixed reality uh, imposed upon that um, and choose to go into VR completely if you want to escape completely or you could uh, go into XR. And so as what will happen then is we'll have, I think, technology that will enable us to play more narrative driven games where we are the star of our own film, for example, um, or, you know, we are able to then communicate either with um, other uh, people who are playing the parts or with AI that has been, um, uh, you know, uh, ha ha effectively works like it's another character, you know, with all the nuances of maybe a real human being. And I think that this is something that uh, Oculus who make the headsets, um, the Quest 2 headset have already identified as something like 25% of the uh, so-called game uh, game enthusiast market, which is that uh, those people who want to be transported to another world, who want new art storytelling, who want um, to uh, uh, fall in love with characters and, uh, and uh, diverse worlds, and because the technology really isn't quite there yet, we're still not seeing a demand for the people to write those kind of stories. But I think that's where we will go. And I think the with me, my approach to it is very much like, well, let's create those stories using techniques that writers and theatre writers have been using by using actors to help them get under the skin of uh, what real people, how real people behave, um, rather than thinking about it. And, and and spending lots of time and money creating AI where you actually can model that sort of behavior a lot more cheaply, authentically and, and, and quickly uh, with actors. I think that once we get the two industries talking to each other, the old video game and immersive industry with um, uh, the uh, traditional theater and uh, drama industry, then we've got, we're gonna, we're gonna move a lot faster, I think. Great. I have a question here from Lou Jones. You mentioned writers that, that are other people's mercy. Any advice on making things happen ourselves? I can only really go on my own uh, uh, sort of journey and how I did it. Um, thankfully, it's not a story about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, <laughs> but it is. Um, uh, well, basically, I said, OK, in 2013, I said, well, I really need to. Well, basically, about 10 years ago, I'll get really tired of acting um, 
uh, um, I need to start writing, I'm now ready, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm feeling the buzz. And then by 2013, when I saw there was money going for First World War, I thought, oh, there's a subject I already love, um, I know a bit about, I can do some research on it. And I went to the Heritage Lottery Fund and they were giving out 10 grand grants if as long as you partnered, we are partnered with Tara Art. So basically I bullied them into uh, um, returning my calls and having a meeting with me. And they're, what they said to me, so they're not going to pay you to write a play, but well, they will pay you to do a bunch of workshops with volunteers to examine the research, to get active in bringing these sort of uh, people together. And they'll, and then you can use some of that money to produce the radio drama as well. And so I thought, oh, well, that's great. So um, I've never written anything uh, <laughs> apart from, you know, a couple of short films, but what that did was it announced me that I was going to do that. And uh, the National Theatre even saw it and said, oh, can you do a rehearsed reading of that? And as time got, got close, as, as it got close to the time, I thought, actually, now I do actually have to write this because I've never actually written anything and they're putting so much trust in me. But it, 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 my answer is, there is money out there that you can raise um, to do it. And you might not be money that pays you to do the writing, but it will pay you to get it on um, on your website or to create the actual thing. And I went and at the time I was working as an actor, um, as a visiting actor on Tommy's. And um, I said, you know, I turned up, I said to Jonathan, I said, you know, I do this already. I already write and produce a play that has done it. And um, he, he just took it and blessed him. He went, fantastic, come and write, <laughs> can you come and write for us then? <laughs> and um, I think somebody said to me 20 years ago, um, uh, a well-known playwright, Sean Khan, he said, um, he said, mate, don't sit around waiting for them to discover your genius because they won't, because yeah. it's all subjective. It's not like maths. It's not right or wrong. Um, just make, make something and there's, go and get some of the public money that's available to do it. So here's a question um, um, following on from that. Have you ever uh, thought of making a podcast or making an audio drama podcast? Because that you yes. talked about the Wild West earlier podcasting is the is genuinely the wild west and is arguably the most democratized democratized form of self-expression that exists in the world today yeah. i had something truly extraordinary um from one of the big pod because i have a podcast with one of the big podcasting uh, sites 40 percent of americans four zero percent of americans listened to a podcast last week yes yeah. just that in itself is mind-boggling well, well I, here's my question have you ever thought of of, of you know because you can make them relatively uh, quickly and um inexpensively i mean obviously there's an issue around how, how you monetize it but as a platform, as a platform well, the thing is, i think you hit the nail on the head because um you know for me and the question that was uh, uh, somebody asked before i forgot um i don't really write unless i think i can get, can monetize it or um somebody is going to read it with a view to produce it because i just don't see the point anymore um, you know, producing content for me, and I'm, this is me just totally speaking for myself, and it might be a really unpopular thing to say. I, I, I just can do too many other things. I'm interested in too many other things to sit around hoping that someone's going to buy something and that I've done, put loads of time and effort into. And I think that I thought Subterranean Sea Boys was a podcast. A lot of this is about definition because what I did was I just put it, made a website and put it on there. And uh, to me, that's a podcast. It's just happened to be just one episode. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? so, so, so I think that, yes, I thought about writing a podcast, but for me, it's like the big question is where's the money? And that's why my career has all these different strands because they're different strands that could, you know, that um, pay my way because um, ultimately about 10 or eight years ago, I went, right, no more of this working for nothing. Yeah. So what's making what where where's what, what's making the money for you at the moment? <laughs> Ironically, it was acting. Complete accident. Um, nothing. I'm unemployed. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the position of pretty much most writers. I um, I uh, don't have an agent. Uh, I have no commissions. Uh, I have nothing on the horizon, uh, and it doesn't bother me at all because I spent 25 years as an actor and I have an agent, I have one of the top agents in the country for many years. Um, and it's exactly the same position. It just doesn't really register with me anymore that that's an issue. Right, mm. right. 
Here's another question from Robert Parks. Increasingly, I'm working collaboratively, collaboratively and the difficulties it's presenting are really unexpectedly challenging. It's a good question. Do you find collaborative work takes you out of your comfort zone? What a good question. Yeah, brilliant question. The answer, the short answer is yes. Um, I've, uh, I think we have Song Yang here, who, who's a VR developer on our, um, on our project, This Is Your Country too. And, you know, just even talking to him made, made me realize how much I had to up my game. And I, that's ultimately what I have to do is, is go out of my comfort zone and declaring that you're going to do your, do something forces you to do that. I think that you do end up, um, I do end up finding reserves that I never knew I had and the quality of what I do increases hugely in a short space of time as a result. I think that that's what I always wanted to do as an actor, but unfortunately people, you know, are not necessarily looking for actors who want to up their game. They're looking for actors who are out of their reach, a bit like buying a house. You know, you're always looking at the, the one that's 15, 20 grand more than what you've got. Uh, <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a question that's going to supplementary to that. Does mm. <clears throat> being an actor in a rehearsal room and being part of a team give you um, a, a, a better ability to navigate the nature of collaboration? Whereas writers, if they're working independently, um, can, and I'm, I speak for myself at times, become quite defensive about their work and yeah. quite, uh, and, and almost, and almost, um, cut themselves off from what would be a really good collaboration simply because of, you know, a sense of um, insecurity, ego, a mixture of things. Good things, of course, you need some of that in order to write in the first place. But I'm wondering whether you being an actor working in a team, you know, everybody has to, to, to do their job in order for the whole experience to work. And I wonder whether that just gives you a, a kind of insight and ability to work collaboratively better. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat the question? Does, sorry, I, I waffled on then. Um, does being an, does have your experience as an actor make you a better collaborator? Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, it's very interesting what you do. You said there about um, the, the sort of linear, the, the solitary life of a writer and being, you know, um, the danger of becoming too uh, attached to your work and your ideas. I'm not really like that. And you know, I like other people to go, oh, I'm going to change that, I'm going to make it better, and I'm going to still keep your name on it, which is kind of what, you know, <laughs> happened a bit on Tommy's, which is great. <laughs> they said, we're going to make this a lot better, but you can take the credit for it. Um, because ultimately, you learn from that, and you say, well, I'm going to do it like that next time, or yeah, I've learned something. But if people aren't, if people are going to make it, people rarely are making it worse, I find. Um, and the people who are making it worse, you don't, buy into your work you usually find that actually you're a bit overqualified so I'm finding that talking to video gamers and people like that you know don't want to insult anyone but you know it's got to be straight up they don't know they don't know the quality they, they have no idea what good quality is because um, they've yet to really encounter uh, real writing <laughs> That's, uh, um, and so I think that you have to sort of say when you do collaborate just make sure you're collaborating with people who either respect the fact that you're a writer um, and you know your shit, or that who 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 are going to help you make that a bit better. So for the directors I work with, for example, they will say, "Oh yeah, that sounds great, and I really love this, but I think this bit doesn't work. How about if we try it this way?" And it, I want that because yes. I don't. Otherwise, you spend hours thinking about it yourself. When someone tells you in twenty seconds, "This is shit." Yeah, I think David Hare said there's you never yeah. waste time sitting in a rehearsal room with some actors working on your material it's never it, yeah. it, you're always going to come away with 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 a, again, a series of options and um understandings that um, yeah that's, it's workshopping yeah that's what I love about it yeah so we've got two two more questions before the end um I'm going to I'm actually going to give Jonathan's question at the end because it's it has it kind of rounds things off nicely but so I'm going to ask for Song Yang's question have you found working with other technologies changed your approach and methodology to writing oh completely i absolutely do not know what i'm doing now um uh i can't i don't, I can't even know where to start <laughs> it's the honest answer <laughs> there's an honest answer song yang's song yang's been through the pain of you know watching me uh trying to talk my way through you know bluff my way through it um but the um always be a yeah pleasure. I mean, writing a play, writing a play was, was really easy for me by the, by the time I got to halfway, when I say easy, I mean, you know, I, I didn't have to go and ask loads of other people uh, how to do it. 
because ultimately, you know, you follow a structure that's very similar to the film structure. Mm -hmm. And having worked on all those uh, previous radio dramas and Tommy's, I, I knew what to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, instinctively knew what was right and wrong. But I think with um, going into VR and immersive, um, I'm, I'm really having to learn a whole new uh, language, methodology, uh, and... Um, I don't even have the materials to write it on. So just writing on a piece on a word document or a or a, or a you know uh, they don't they don't exist. You kind of have to just you have to build the the language your the, your uh, materials yourself of how to tell the story. So here you are trying to build a story and uh, work with these new materials. And Jonathan's question is very appropriate. Apart from the things he's told you, <laughs> what's the worst piece of writing advice that you've ever had? <laughs> no no i think it's pretty much all of jonathan's really uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but has oh, been cliches, cliches 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 all the cliches um kill your babies yeah you know uh, no that's not a bad piece of advice that's a brilliant piece of advice um i don't know most of the bad advice i get is not actually right writing it's kind of just it's the stuff that you send into literary departments where they try to tell you how to go about improving your script yeah. and these people because they don't really have any stake in it their yeah. job is to get rid of you and say something encouraging you know they're not people who put their 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 lives you know their they, have no skin, the they have no skin in the game to use that yeah yeah exactly um i think that you um the worst piece of writing i i can't think of it right now but um i think Oh, concentrate on store. It's just, no, I can't think of it. All my bad advice is usually acting. <laughs> <laughs> Avid, it's been an absolute delight. Fantastic talking to you and to hear about yeah. your process. Thank you so much. And particularly, it's been wonderful to hear about the, your work in uh, virtual reality. Um, uh, we're, we're just about to go. I'm just going to very quickly plug a, a festival that I've been involved with over the last five years called the Audio uh, drama festival international audio drama festival um www.radiodramafestival.org.uk it's the only outward looking international radio drama festival and we have i think it's 71 plays from from places as far 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 afield as iran india and uh, eastern europe uh, and it's taking place next week and you can listen to them online if you would like to go to the website so that's my plug for the festival